الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده سبحانه وتعالى حمد المعترفين بنعمائه العظيمة وآلائه الجسيمة اللهم لك الحمد يا ربنا كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك جل وجهك وعز جاهك تفعل ما تشاء بقدرتك اللهم لك الحمد يا ربنا بأن أرسلت إلينا أعظم رسول أرسل ولك الحمد بأن أنزلت علينا أعظم كتاب أنزل وهديتنا لمعالم دينك الذي ليس به التباس وجعلتنا من خير أمة أخرجت للناس وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صفيه من خلقه وحبيبه بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في الله حق الجهاد حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم صلي وسلم وبارك وزد وبارك على الحبيب المصطفى محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه ومن اهتدى بهديه وعمل بسنته إلى يوم الدين وارض اللهم عنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Endless is in his glory The creator of heavens and earth The source of every bounty The source of every light I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala For the blessings that he has granted us And our loved ones And we express our gratitude To the Lord in words and action And we say alhamdulillah for blessings that we know and blessings that we do not, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us worthy and deserving of His blessings. Allahumma ameen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to extend His blessings upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the role model to humanity, the blessing that Allah has granted each and every one of us, the favor that Allah has bestowed upon us. I ask Allah to make us among those who love the Prophet وسلم, and those who walk in his footsteps and those who live and die by his boundaries. I ask Allah to extend his blessings to the Prophet's family and his descendants, to the Prophet's companions and their followers and all men and women that walk in their footsteps and I ask Allah to make us among them. Allahumma ameen. My dear brothers and sisters, I greet you with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We've been blessed this summer, alhamdulillah, with an incredible journey. About five weeks ago, we set out with the intent and the premise that we would like to cover one of the gems of the Prophet's legacy, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A particular hadith that talks about how we're supposed to take advantage of the blessings that we have before it's too late and before those blessings are taken away from us. This is the hadith in Bukhari of Abdullah ibn, uh, ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu in which he said the Prophet taught me alayhi salatu wassalam اغتنم خمسا قبل خمس take advantage of five before five things happen شبابك قبل هرمك وصحتك قبل سقمك وحياء وفراغك قبل شغلك وغناك قبل فقرك وحياتك قبل موتك Take advantage of those five things before five terrible things happen. Take advantage of your youth before your old age. Of your health before your sickness. Of your wealth before your poverty. Of your free time before you get extremely busy. And take advantage of your life before your death. The first Friday was an introduction and then we had four khutbas afterwards in which we covered four components of the hadith. And today, inshaAllah ta'ala, we will cover the fifth and last component of this hadith. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the honor of being those who spread the word of Rasulullah in the world. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who have the dignity of carrying with them the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And to make us worthy of that honor. We've lived by this beautiful hadith this summer. We've talked about it at Jum'ah. We've talked to our children about it. And we've been reminded of just one hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa throughout an entire summer. Hayataka 
قبل موتك. Your life before your death. But I want to talk to you first about something else. It's a subject that I've never addressed before, not publicly, not to such a large audience. And this is the subject of the signs of the hour, the signs of the end of times, the signs of Yawmul Qiyamah, the day of judgment. And I particularly want to talk about the minor signs. Why? Because my daughter came to me a few days ago with screenshots from, Sna from uh, Instagram. In one of those accounts on Instagram, they basically posted the signs of the hour, the signs of the day of judgment, one after the other, in long lists, five or six pages. And it was over 75 of those. And each item has a little box next to it, and they either check the box if the sign has already happened, or they leave the box unchecked if it hasn't happened yet, right? And I flick through the pages one after the other and I realize that most of the boxes are what? Most of the boxes are checked. So I was like, this can't be true. I've always known that a great deal of the signs of the Day of Judgment have, have already happened, but not most of them. I mean, literally only just a few left. So I went back and I did some research and I looked at the hadith and I was astonished by the tremendous reality and that is the vast majority of the minor signs of the Day of Judgment have already taken place, brothers and sisters. Which gave a very different meaning to me when I was preparing the khutbah. Hayataka qabla mawtik. There is my own life as a, as a Muslim and as a human being. And then there is the life of our ummah. And the life of our civilization. My life comes to an end with what the scholars would call Al-Qiyamatu Suhra, the minor Qiyamah, when I go to my grave. But the life of the world will come to an end when Yawmul Qiyamah comes, the day of judgment. And I want to share with you some of the articles on that list, just to give you a few examples. So that you, you believe me, and you realize that I'm not making this up because I was really stunned looking at the list. Okay? In both Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet says, In Bayna Yada Yisaati la Ayama Yanzilu fiha al Jahl, wa yurfa fiha al Ilm, wa yakthuru fiha al Haraj. The Prophet ﷺ in this hadith that is mentioned in both Bukhari and Muslim, that in the days approaching closer to the day of judgment, people will experience those three things. Ignorance will be so widespread, it'll be all over. And good, useful knowledge will be raised, it'll disappear. People will learn about things that are completely useless. You know, ilmun la yanfa, as the scholars would say. But there will be very little useful knowledge in the world. وَيَكْثُرُ فِيهَا الْهَرَجْ There will be so much killing. There will be so much killing. And I ask you, brothers and sisters, today, and you be the judge, happened or did not happen? All of it. In the hadith that is in Imam Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ says, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ I swear by who in whose hands is my soul. لَيَأْتِيَنَّ عَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَانٌ لَا يُدْرِكُ الْقَاتِلُ فِي مَقَتَلْ وَلَا الْمَقْتُولُ فِي مَقُتِلْ A day will come that people will kill each other and they don't know why they're killing each other. And, and those who get killed, they don't understand why they got killed. They're just collateral damage. Why? Because back in the day, at least people gave you the honor of telling you why they want to kill you. They want to come mug you, take your money, attack you in your home and take your stuff and take your life. They get so angry and they attempt to hurt you. But today, there is a coward that sits in an office somewhere dressed in a really nice suit with a really nice title before and after their name who is holding a little joystick with a red button and he's manning a drone and that drone hovers over Sana'a in Yemen and he drops a couple of loads and kills 200 people and he doesn't know their names or why they died. I'm just following orders. Happened or did not happen? It happens today and has been happening for the longest time. That people die. 
they're going shopping or going to buy some pizza for their kids or going to the marketplace or get some coffee and somebody walks into the pizzeria and, and, and sets themselves off or, you know, everybody dies within like a, you know, a 200 feet vicinity. It has been happening. In the hadith that Imam al-Hakim mentioned in al-Mustadrak, the Prophet ﷺ says, وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِهِ I swear by he in whose hands is the very soul of Muhammad. لا تقوم الساعة حتى يكثر الفحش والتفحش. The day of judgment will not come until those things happen. Fuhsh, profanity, and tafahush. And I will tell you what that means in one second. Al-fuhsh wa tafahush. وقطيعة الأرحام. And people severing their kin. وسوء المجاورة people being bad neighbors to each other ويخون فيها الأمين ويؤمن فيها الخائن the day of judgment will not come unless these things happen number one people will practice profanity and فحش is when you are profane you say bad words you practice terrible haram things right but we've taken it to the next level now profanity is not just an individual behavior it's become a competition People compete with each other on who's going to be more profane than the other. And who is capable of more terrible things than the other. And who can do more horrifying things than the other. You know, some of these rap videos that our youth watch. Modern day rappers, they compete with each other on who will say more bad words. And who will present more graphic content? And who has more tattoos? And who, ha who will objectify women more? And who will be absolutely sickening more than the other person? To the extent that some of these youth, they're telling me, Imam, we're not really enjoying the song anymore. But the content is so horrific that we're, sh that we're watching it. And we're sharing it with each other. Oh my God, did you see this new rap song? Oh my, I can't believe what they said. But you know what this does, brothers and sisters? It drives up the demand. It gives them more views on YouTube. And they realize that there are people out there that desire this type of material. Even if it's terrible, don't come near it. Walk away from it. Don't share it. Don't think about it. That is a sick content. You cannot see. Fuhsh and tafahush. People competing with each other on who will become more fahsh than the other. Who will become more profane than the other. And when people don't practice the haram, they make fun of them. And they say something is wrong. So some of these poor people, they do something wrong and profane just because other people expect them to. Just so that they avoid bullying at school. وَإِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ لَا تَقُومُ السَّاعَةُ حَتَّى يَكْثُرُ الْفُحْشُ وَالْتَفَحْشُ وَقَطِيعَةُ الْأَرْحَامِ People who sever their kin. Oh, I have a brother that I haven't seen in 20 years. Oh, my mom is overseas. The last time I called her was like a few months ago. I have a cousin in another country that I've never met. How often do you hear this stuff? In fact, there will be relatives in the same town. They live in the same town and they have cut each other off. And they don't meet each other. They don't talk to each other. They don't say Eid Mubarak to each other. When one of them attends one event, the other one does not show up. Happened or did not happen? That's the Prophet ﷺ telling you about this stuff 1400 years ago. Sallallahu ala Muhammad. In the hadith in Imam Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ says, لا تقوم الساعة حتى يقبض العلم The day of judgment will not come unless, again, as we said earlier, knowledge, true knowledge will be lifted up. It will disappear from the world. وتكثر الزلازل Pay attention to this. Earthquakes will become more rampant. Natural disasters will become very common. Happened or did not happen? You be the judge. Everywhere. Subhanallah. لا تقوم الساعة حتى يقبض العلم وتكثر الزلازل ويتقارب الزمان. Ya Allah. Time will feel that it is passing faster, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَيَتَقَارَبُ zaman. Time will feel that it's passing faster. 1400 years ago, he predicted something that you and I experience every, sing every single day. Oh my God, what, what happens? What has happened to our time? You know, the week passes in a second. What's going on? Where does all the time go? How often do you say this? 
Every single one of you says this, even little kids going to school. And the Prophet ﷺ predicted it, alayhi salatu wasalam. Remember in the hadith of Bukhari, where the Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the Messenger وسلم, and he's dressed up in white and he sits in front of the Prophet and puts his hands on the Prophet's thigh and he, he, he starts asking him questions about Islam and Ihsan and Iman. Remember that hadith? Everyone knows that hadith in Bukhari, right? The very end of the hadith is the one that we don't talk about very often. Jibreel asks the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, قَالَ أَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ السَّاعَةِ Tell me about the hour. Tell me about the end of times. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, مَا الْمَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا بِأَعْلَمَ مِنَ السَّائِلِ The one who's being asked possesses no more knowledge than the one who's asking. In other words, I don't know anything about it or when it'll happen. قَالَ فَمَا أَشْرَاطُهَا Tell me then about its tokens. What are the signs of the hour? قَالَ أَن تَلِدَ الْأَمَةُ رَبَّتَهَا the, the girl will give birth to its master. And in the other narration, أَن تَلِدَ الْأَمَةُ رَبَّهَا In the masculine, its master. What does that mean? وَأَن تَرَ الْحُفَاةَ الْعُرَاةَ الْعَالَةَ رِعَاءَ الشَّاءِ يَتُطَاوَلُونَ فِي الْبُنِيَا and you will see the destitute, the poor, who have no clothes to cover their skin, who are barefoot, who used to herd animals, right? Like the French who would call them the sans -culotte. You would find those people building skyscrapers. Happened or did not happen? 1400 years ago, how would the Prophet ﷺ, how that would the idea even cross his mind that there will be an age in which people will be building skyscrapers. How is that even possible? How is that even possible? I mean, skyscrapers is such a modern idea. There's so much earth. Why are we not, why are we not bu building vertically? Why are we building horizontally? That idea would have not occurred to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? But let me go back to, What does that mean? That the, the girl will give birth to its own master. The scholars, wallahi, you read the interpretations of the scholars of hadith, you will laugh. Because the scholars struggle to understand what that meant. So they would say, well, it's because a time will come when daughters will mistreat their mothers. So the, the, the girl will give birth to someone that will eventually mistreat her like a master mistreats the slave, right? Which is a little flimsy, but could work. And other scholars would say that slavery will become so commonly practiced that a man would have intimate relations with a slave girl and they would have a baby and this baby will grow up to become a royalty and will treat his or her own mother like their slave. Which definitely happened historically. But today this becomes so relevant. Why? Because you read in the news today about wealthy Western families who would like to have a baby and, you know, they try and try and try for years and years and years and it doesn't work. So they start doing IVF and all this stuff. And they spend so much money and it doesn't work, right? So what is the resort now that a lot of people are using, going to? Those wealthy families, they would find a poor woman in India or Bangladesh or Africa or even somewhere here in America. Like well, a homeless woman. And that wealthy family would pay her fifteen or $20,000 in order to do what? in order to plant the baby in her womb. You know, they call it womb rentals. Wallahi, that's not... There's going to be like a, an Airbnb for wombs now. Right? This is, this is true. This is happening today. This is not a prediction of the future. This is happening today. Right? And they would pay this lady money, and then when the lady gives birth to the baby, they would have her sign all these disclosures and all this these paperwork in order to say, I will never claim legally claim this baby, I will never attempt to see the baby, I will never say that that baby is mine, never. I will never see this baby again for the rest of your life, uh, of my life. What is that called? It's called surrogacy. I feel in my heart that the Prophet ﷺ was predicting a time in which this type of stuff is happening, the surrogacy stuff. When babies are born, they don't know who their biological parents are, and nobody really cares. What matters is who raises you, and not who gave birth to you. That's the argument now. The argument is who raises you and not who gave birth to you. It doesn't matter who your biological parents are anymore. Everything is mixed up and messed up. The Prophet ﷺ in the hadith, and this was mentioned in Tabarani, he says to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Ya ibn Mas'ud, wa min alamat al-qiyamah, 
أن يكتفي الرجال بالرجال وتكتفي النساء بالنساء One of the signs of the day of judgment is that men will be content by just being with other men and they desire just men. And women will just desire other women. We're definitely headed there. Happening or not happening, there is a culture out there that wants to make it okay. Not just okay. Celebrate it. Forcing you to accept it and, to, and for your children to accept it. Brothers and sisters, it's not about homosexuality. It's just about sexuality. I don't want to talk to my kids about sexuality at the age of seven. Heterosexual or otherwise. Why are you forcing me to start conversations with my kids about homosexuality when I have not even talked to them about straight relationships? Problematic or not problematic? I'm getting emails, by the way, from the Mormons, from the Episcopalians, from the Methodists and other Christian groups that are organizing meetings here in Placer County to examine the curriculum, the academic curriculum that is going to be imposed on our children pretty soon. And if you don't do something about it, this, this will become what the kids are going to be studying at school, by the way. You know, those of you who live in this area, if you're not aware of this, the curriculum is going to change very soon. And there's a lot of religious groups that are trying to stop that from happening. The Prophet ﷺ predicted these realities 1400 years ago. In Hiliyat al-Awliya, Abu Nu'aym al-Asbahani mentions a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that just seals the deal. Subhanallah. وَمِنْ قُرْبِ السَّاعَةِ تَشَبُّهُ الرِّجَالُ بِالنِّسَاءِ وَتَشَبُّهُ النِّسَاءُ بِالرِّجَالِ One of the signs that the hour has neared is that men want to become like women and women want to look like men. Right? So you see these people randomly on the street and you start scratching the back of your head. Right? Is, is that a guy or a girl? Have you done that before? How often do you do that? We do it more often than like, five years ago. We do it a lot more often than ten years ago. Right? That right there, that confusion right there is one of the signs of the hour. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you and your loved ones from this. Allahumma ameen. Even if you examine the, uh, the petty state of American politics and politics in general, Wallahi, it'll tell you a lot about what the Prophet said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You have a sitting president, a sitting president who makes it okay to literally call four elected congresswomen of color, minority congresswomen in America that harassed people of color for hundreds of years. He makes it okay to say, you go back to your country. That has become okay. Wallahi, five years ago, we would have not believed this stuff even if it's in a movie. If they told us this will be in a movie, we would have not, oh, that's too much fiction. Now it's become the reality. The worst of the worst become leaders in this day and age. The dreg of the earth are climbing up the ladder of power. And all good and righteous people, they want to be as far from politics as possible because it's just so corrupt. But the flip side of the coin is that this enables terrible people to become our leaders, to become our politicians, right? What does the Prophet say وسلم, in the hadith? When trusts are lost, await the day of judgment. So they asked him, Ya Rasulullah, wa kayfa dayaawha? How is the amana lost? He said, Ida usnida al amru li ghayri ahlihi fantadiru sa'a. When positions of authority and leadership are granted to those who are not fit, that is how trusts are lost, and that's when you await the day of judgment. You be the judge. Happened or didn't happen? Examine the entire Muslim world, except for a few exceptions, a little bit here and there. Most leaders are corrupt across the board. They compete with each other on who's going to commit more fuhsh than the other. Wallahi. Most of them. Why do I bring this up? Because again, I told you there's like over 70 examples. And I can give a series of khutbas just about that. Okay? But I bring it up today because it gave a very different meaning to the idea in the hadith, Hayatak qabla mawti. The idea that you need to take advantage of your life before your death. How much time is still left? If God forbid our generation is the generation that will have to experience the day of judgment. How do we know? I mean, I pray inshallah that that won't happen. Because I don't think that I'm prepared. I don't think that any of you prepared to 
experience such terrible and dark times. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there's still time before that. But it is either that our generation will have to experience it, or our children, or our grandchildren. We're, it's close. It's close. That's what we know for sure, that it's very, very close, right? Which also means that what we do with our lives today will determine whether upcoming generations are prepared for that hour when it comes or not. Isn't that true? What we do today will define what happens next. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us this in the Qur'an. What is it that they're waiting for? What is it that they're waiting for? Are they waiting for the hour to come and hit them suddenly? Its signs are already here. The tokens of the hour are already here. فَقَدْ جَاءَ أَشْرَاطُهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Muhammad. The signs of the hour are here. What are you waiting for? And I don't want the picture to be grim, brothers and sisters. Okay? Because that's the reality that we sometimes forget. But here's the thing. The Prophet ﷺ also taught us that in the midst of all this chaotic events of the world, there are people who are still trying to do the right thing. I mean, if you look at planet Earth, you know, from a macroscopic perspective, it looks pretty bad. Natural disasters, war, carnage, chaos, injustice, poverty, all over, right? Even, even the West, all the things that we used to take for granted, I mean, we can't take them for granted anymore. God knows what's going to happen in the next few years, right? We're going to be fighting for the very basic rights that we assumed are ours, right? But if you zoom in the, into the world a little bit, you will see a few positive examples. You will see that there are certain Muslim communities that are trying to do the right thing. You will see the Senegal. You will see Malaysia. You'll see Turkey. You'll see even Ethiopia. MashaAllah, they're doing such a tremendous job. And it take, I, I'm just I'm amazed at how much good one good and righteous leader can achieve in a very, very short period of time. And how much destruction a bad leader can achieve in a very, very short period of time. SubhanAllah. That's why I, I invite you, brothers and sisters, take matters into your own hands. I want to see more and more members of our community running for office. There's over 60 Muslims that have run for office and won, by the way, in the last election cycle. In the era of Trump, that is a sign of hope. When you look at the state of, of, of our country today or the state of the world, there are still little beautiful signs of hope here and there. I just came back from Turkey. And that's a pretty beautiful, shining sign of hope. Alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you that some people are still doing their job. The American Muslim community, despite the odds, is working extremely hard to guard the posts. In a clear reflection of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, ironically also about the end of times. And this is a hadith narrated by Muawiyah. لا تزال طائفة من أمتي قائمين على الحق لا يضرهم من خذلهم أو خالفهم حتى يأتي أمر الله وهم على ذلك There will always be a cohort of the believers doing the right thing guarding their posts guarding values and principles They don't care whether people support them or not They don't care whether their ideas are popular or not They will continue doing the right thing until the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes upon them in that very state That is a sign of hope and when I say hayataka qabla mawtik, take advantage of your life before your death, that's precisely what I mean. I may not be able to stop the wars from happening. I may not be able to stop Trump from doing what he's doing. I may not be able to stop Modi from harassing Muslims in India or Sisi from harassing free people in Egypt or Assad from killing people in Syria. I may not be able to change the universe. But I can choose to be among those who are trying to. Those who are trying to change the world. And they don't care if they're popular or not. And they go against the grain. And they don't, they don't pay attention to popular culture and what other people tell them. Society tells them go left and they continue to go right. Society tells them to go down and they continue to rise and ascend. That's the spirit. And that is what I want to live for and die for. That's the meaning of it all. 
The signs of the Day of Judgment are here. We are taking steady steps towards our demise, every single one of us. But the Prophet ﷺ taught us that as long as there is a breath of air in your chest, the, but the battle goes on. The battle goes on and you continue to fight. And you don't let yourself wither like everybody else. You're not a leaf carried by the wind. You own your own destiny. And with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to make up your mind of who you are and what your, what your identity is and what you need to achieve. Ask yourself, regardless of age, how do I plan to use the rest of my days? To further my own self-interest? To make more money? To build my own ego further? Or to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and serve my community and leave a legacy that my children will be proud of when I leave this world. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our good deeds and forgive us our sins. I ask Allah to establish us firmly on his path. Brothers and sisters, raise your hands and speak to Allah Azza wa from the heart. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين به ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وقائد الغر الميامين محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وارض عنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين My dear brothers and sisters It's a blessed conclusion of this hadith that we started our summer off with in which the Prophet ﷺ says اغتنم خمسا قبل خمس Take advantage of five before five And today we talked about حياتك قبل موتك The very last component of the hadith Take advantage of your life before death comes upon you. Qiyamatu al-Sughra, the minor qiyama, which happens to every single one of us when we go to our graves, and al-Qiyamatu al-Kubra, you know, the major qiyama, the day of judgment, when it's going to happen upon each and every one of us or whoever that's going to remain here from our descendants. And I said that the Prophet ﷺ taught us that there is going to be a group of people that will continue to invest in their days and do the right thing and guard their posts regardless of whether they're getting support or not. And they will live and die in that state and you should always pray and strive to be among them until the very last breath in your life. And here's the thing. I actually feel that we are at a historic opportunity as an ummah right now. You know, it's easy to think of it as all negative and bleak and grim and bad. We are definitely at the tapering end of civilization. Muslim civilization at least. We are at the tapering end of the curve. But I always say, when the curve you know, tapers off, what usually happens after? It's got to pick up again. Being at the tapering end, the tail end of civilization means that you are the cusp of a new renaissance. You are at the cusp of another growth. Are you going to be part of that or not? Why do I say this? I'm Wallahi, I am 100% certain of that in my heart like I see you right now. Why? Because historically, Islam, its tenets, its teachings, its discourse, its fiqh, its law, its philosophy, all of its components were always discussed and debated in very, very biased environments. Why is that? Because the state always played a huge role in determining which component or understanding of Islam is accepted or practiced. Now, most of the time, they excluded bad practices, but sometimes they also ex they wanted to exclude the orthodox practices. If you remember the story of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rising against the state, the state basically sponsored a completely de de deviant understanding of Islam. And if it wasn't for Imam Ahmad and his colleagues, our ummah would have looked very, very differently today. Historically, the state either sponsored an understanding of Islam that supported it and supported those who are in power, supported particular ventures, particular scholarships, particular scientific efforts, and they basically muted the others that they did not like and support. Or they outright fought such efforts up until today. 
Iran continues to be the sponsor of Shia Islam. Saudi Arabia continues to be the sponsor of Sunni Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroy tyranny in all of its forms. All of its forms. Until today, those two tyrants, they continue to speak on behalf of the Muslims. Representing no Muslims in the process whatsoever. In this country, until recently, it was because of Saudi money and Wahhabi funding that the major accepted understanding of Islam in most American masajid was their understanding. Was it because it was the right understanding? No, no. It was just a properly funded understanding. Alhamdulillah, we don't live in those times anymore. And here's what I, what I wanted to say. We are at a cusp of a historic opportunity. Why? Because the Western Muslim community has a chance today to debate Islam and its teachings and its philosophy and its tenets without the sponsorship or the pressure of the state. For the first time in the history of our ummah, Islam can be debated in a free society. And that will have tremendous consequences. People in Muslim countries, they go and uh, they go pray Jum'ah, right? And you are coming here to pray Jum'ah as well. Can we say that you, as American Muslims coming to Jum'ah, are equivalent to people in Pakistan or Egypt going to Jum'ah? Absolutely not. Why? Because over there they go to Jum'ah because everybody goes to Jum'ah. Everybody expects you to go to Jum'ah. And if you don't go to Jum'ah, there's something wrong with you. But here, everyone expects you not to go to Jum'ah. And you still make a choice to come to Jum'ah. Why? Because in your heart you think it's the right thing to do. That's the harvest of the renaissance that I'm telling you about. We are at that opportunity. If we support the institutions of our community, if we support the organizations of our community, we have that historic chance for Islam to be repackaged while maintaining its orthodoxy, but it's repackaged to win the hearts and the minds of modern people today with no pressure, with no coercion, with no sponsorship, with no funding, by just doing the right thing. You let Islam be investigated freely, everyone is going to come to it. That's a sign of hope or not. And this is happening while we're still getting closer to the Day of Judgment. That's fine. But we still have to do our part. We still have a few hundred years, a few thousand years. It's all in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As long as we're still here, we still strive and we still try. And we still try to take advantage of our lives before minor or major death come upon us. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us our sins, to establish us firmly on his path. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant the health of heart and mind to this ummah and this community. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant enlightenment to our hearts, to our conversations, and to our discourse. I ask Allah to strengthen the parents of our community, to protect and preserve the children of our community. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow His love and grace upon each and every one of us and our families and our friends and our loved ones. I ask Allah to protect our institutions, our leaders, to protect our hearts and to protect, protect our minds. I ask Allah to protect the successes and the winnings of our Muslim community and to make it grow. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us sincerity in our actions and purity in our intentions. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen our brotherhood and sisterhood and to establish us firmly on his path and to make us among those who take advantage of the rest of their days. And Ya Allah, as you've gathered us here in this shape and form, we ask you to gather all of us in the highest level of Jannah. Allahumma ameen.